Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, I'm going to work on my Commodore Plus 4. Specifically, I want to talk about the power supply. Now, the Commodore Plus 4 has a different architecture than the Commodore 64, but from a power perspective, what goes into the side here is very similar to the C64. In fact, it's actually the same. You can use a Commodore 64 power supply interchangeably, except for one problem. Here's the power input jack on the Plus 4, and yeah, there's an issue. It's square. Here's the power supply brick that comes with the Plus 4, and yes, it has the matching square connector that goes into the back of the computer. Why did Commodore change this up from the C64? I have no idea, but around the time this came out, they were kind of switching to this square connector anyways. The Amiga 500 uses it, also the C128, although these are not compatible with each other. Some are going to ask why I'm even talking about the power supply. I mean, I have the included power supply, so what's my problem? Well, the issue is these power supplies, which are extremely heavy and solid, epoxy filled, are the same type that the Commodore 64 has, that when they go bad, they send higher than 5 volts directly into the computer, which essentially kills it. Internally, this just has a 9 volt AC transformer and then a simple 5 volt linear regulator. But unfortunately, as people have found, as they age, they can possibly send too much voltage into the computer. So with regulators, it normally wouldn't be an issue if you could just get to the 5 volt regulator. You could just change it out for a more modern one, one that won't go bad and kill your computer. But Commodore did something that makes that basically impossible. Now here you see another power supply. It looks basically the same, although you notice there's no wires coming out of it. This one's actually from a C64. But I have actually emptied this out, and I pulled out what was inside, which is this insane thing here. So this is what they did. They put all the electronics inside of this case, same on this one, and then they filled it with this incredibly hard epoxy. This thing is similarly heavy to a brick, like you would build a house out of. So needless to say, it's basically impossible to rebuild this thing. In fact, just getting it out of the case was extremely difficult. So back to the original plus four power supply. What I want to do is I want to stop using this. I'm going to replace this. And I'm going to replace it with this, which is a Commodore 128 power supply. Now I do have this labeled as C128 slash 64, and that's actually because I cut the connector off and I installed the C64 round DIN connector on here. These are much better power supplies. While it's pretty physically large, it has a 9-volt AC transformer inside of it, but it also has a switching and regulated 5-volt power supply, a beefy one at that. So this thing is much less likely to crap out and kill the computer. So this is one I prefer to use with my old vintage electronics. Of course, we run into a problem here. So this C64 connector is just simply not physically compatible with the square connector on the Plus 4. So we're going to have to rectify that. Let's crack open the Plus 4 and take a look at the PCB. Well, through the magic of editing, here is the PCB. So here's the power connector. And one interesting thing is I heard that it is the same pinout on the PCB as the connector from the Commodore 64. So I have a Commodore 64 power connector there, and notice there's quite a different number of pins, but actually only four of them are used. And theoretically, the layout on the board is the same. And you know what? Take a look at that. That absolutely looks the same. There's even some extra holes on the PCB right there that match up with the holes there. How funny is that? Maybe Commodore was originally going to use this round DIN and they decided to change to square at the last minute. So I think the thing to do is remove the original power connector and see if this fits right in and then just double check that the pins match the pins on here for the voltage rails and we should be good to go. So looking at this part of the PCB where the connector is done, this is quite a mess. I guess this is hand soldered and look at all the flux crap on here. So Commodore, you could have spent like a moment to just clean that after you put these connectors on. All right, so let's start getting this off. I'm gonna use my desoldering iron here. All right, so there's the square connector. It just came out of the board. It's a little tricky to get these out because there's some thick traces. So you kind of remove as much solder as you can with the desoldering iron. Then you kind of wiggle it back and forth and heat each pin until they start moving. And this needs a serious cleanup. All right, a little IPA and a little brush. Just kind of clean that up. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. So taking a look at this connector, all the pins line up except for one. This pin here, which is part of this ground plane, 
there is no middle pin there for it to match up to. There are these two side pins that go into those two holes, but that one has nothing to go into. Let's get the cutters here. So now this does appear that it should just go right onto the board. Let's take a look. Oh, look at that. Plugged right in. Taking a look at the back side, all these pins line up perfectly. Everything is in there, so it's as if they designed it for this type of connector. Before I make it permanent, let's put the PCB into the case. Just to make sure that it all lines up perfectly. There we go. Zero issue. I guess the only problem is it's a square hole and we're seeing a little bit of that silver, but see for this plug they actually had a round hole. So it's not perfect, but it's gonna work great. So. I think I'm going to solder this on, and then we'll just test voltages. Alright, so this is the original power supply connected to the original power supply, and it's plugged into the AC mains. And this is the C128 power supply with a 64 connector plugged into this. The board is currently off, but I just want to check the voltages on these pins and make sure it matches up to these. So what I have found is that this pin right here and this pin here are the 5 volt lines. That pin matches up to this middle pin right here. And to these, the bottom, the other pin matches up to these three that are right here. So there we go, 5.2. So that's an absolute match. Switch to AC mode. So these two pins here must be the AC. So we're only getting 2.2 volts. I'm not sure what's up with that. I think the AC is actually used only for the cassette motor and nothing else. So that matches up to this pin and this pin. So we're getting 10.5 on that, which is correct. I don't really know why the AC is so pitiful coming out of this. Let's just test again. Well, regardless, it's not really used for this computer. 5 volt is the most important rail and it definitely matches up on the pinout the, on this board here. So we know we're good to go. Let's uh, bench test this on the monitor. All right, let's plug the 128 power supply in to this machine. Oh, you gotta push hard. So this is a brand new connector and I gotta say it's pretty stiff. Yeah, you gotta push really hard. So I'm probably gonna have to plug and unplug that just a whole bunch of times to loosen it up. All right, let's see, the monitor is connected, power is on, let's turn this on. Okay, well, weird. Huh, is there something wrong with one of my ROM chips? I haven't used this computer in a little while, so that's problematic, but it's obviously initializing the TED, but this almost seems like maybe one of the other ROMs are not inserted all the way. So TED is working, PLA is working. Well, I guess I gotta troubleshoot. Perfect example of me to make a diagnostic ROM for this computer, because that's a bit strange. So to create a diagnostic ROM for your Plus 4 or C16, you're gonna need a cartridge. And this is the C16 Basic Tutor cartridge. I have the sticker on the inside. This, luckily, is the PCB, and if you notice, it's got two sockets on here, which is absolutely perfect. But I'm going to use this cartridge, I'm going to replace the ROM with a new EEPROM, and that should allow me to run the diagnostics. Let's just try this in the computer first, actually, before I take the chip out. Just see if this machine is working with this. Okay, so the cartridge is in, I've actually removed the three ROMs. I left the kernel in, I'm pretty sure that's necessary to boot the computer, but the basic and the plus four software has been taken out. All right, so it's working. I don't know why the software, this flashes. It's always done this on this particular computer, but there the, the program is running, it's working fine. So I guess whatever the problem is with this machine, it's gotta be with these ROM chips. I'm actually curious to see how this works when I have these ROM chips removed here with the kernel in here. Let's just see if I turn this on. Okay, so it's booting up and it just crashes immediately. And that's what I would expect because the kernel ROM is gonna try to be executing the basic or whatever, and that's not there, so it will just crash. Let me put these in one by one. I don't remember which is the basic ROM. I'm gonna reinstall these and just see if I can get the computer working again. Okay, so with the first chip in, it actually boots up 60K free. It doesn't say plus four because you need these other two ROM chips. Let me put these in and see if it's still having that weird issue. Maybe one of these is bad. Okay, says 
press F1 key for 3 plus 1. So there's one more chip here to install. All right, well, I, I don't really know what's going on. I, I just assume one of these chips was loosely installed in the sockets. I did push them down uh, in the middle of troubleshooting, and it was just that same, that blank screen. But it, it does appear to be working right now, but that doesn't stop us. Let's still look at this diagnostic software. So Rob Clark came up with the software Diag264. It's diagnostic software that runs on any of these 264-based machines. The Commodore 16, the Plus 4, and I guess there's a couple other ones that were sold in Europe as well that this works on. I'll put the link in the description here so you can read this for yourself. But it looks like it does a lot of different stuff, checking things on the machine. Uh, and he also suggests opening up one of the cartridges and using the EEPROM inside the socket there, which luckily I can do. He does explain how to make the harness connector so you can test all the I.O. ports. I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to see how this software works on my machine. It works a lot like the dead test cartridge on the C64, as in it does some flashes to help you identify which chip might be bad. And then it goes into a full comprehensive diagnostic test right here in this screenshot. Of course, for me, I'm going to be missing the test harness, so I will have bad listed on some of this stuff, but it's not something I should really worry about. And what's cool is his will do a ROM checksum on the various ROM chips that are in the machine, and he lists here what they should show up as. And there are various versions of the kernel and the PALs and different things like that, including the three plus one functions high and low, so I do have these in my plus four. But one thing to keep in mind, this plus four right now is rocking a 6510C64 processor, kind of like if you watched my C16 video. So I have a modified NTSC kernel in here. So clearly it's not gonna match either of these uh, checksums here. So that's to be expected. I downloaded the zip file on his page and it's nice because he has various kernels here. Because the ROM file is 16K, you're gonna need a 27C128E prom to burn this onto. I'm going to load the NTSC low ROM into the Mini Pro software. The reason for low ROM is on the cartridge there are low ROM and a high ROM. There's two sockets here. So I suppose some games use two and I guess this cartridge is compatible with both. But we'll just be replacing this low ROM which is the Commodore keyboard test software. I'm going to blank check this EEPROM. Oops. Got to turn off check ID because I'm using a different EEPROM than an AMD which is set to. Cool. cool. It's currently blank. Okay, let's program this up. This particular chip is a really old Toshiba chip. And what I normally do is that chip is not found in MiniPro's database. So I check the data sheet and then I write with a Sharpie on the chip, the settings right here. So the pulse delay and the write voltage. So I just pick a regular AMD of the same capacity or whatever Intel chip. And then I change these settings to match this chip from the data sheet. It programs slowly because the pulse delay is so high on this particular chip. But if we do a verify. All right, chip looks programmed successfully. Let's install the EEPROM into the cartridge. Still don't really understand why they would have put sockets in a cartridge. It seems like a needless expense. All right, let's test this out. Okay, there we go. Let's turn this on. Will it work? All right, I think that's the low RAM test. Ooh, it's very colorful. One thing that's pretty neat about this particular series of computers with the TED chip is it does support more colors than the Commodore 64. It's still a maximum of 16 on, on screen at one time. Well, typically without tricks, but the color palette is, is customizable. So you could have a whole bunch of gray shades, for instance. Oh uh, yeah, kernel ROM is bad because I'm using the modified kernel, but the low and high uh, plus four ROMs are looking good. Basic ROM is looking good. Neat, look at all those colors. Cool, so the interrupts are good, the 2x clock is good, everything looks fine. So I think it just cycles through the test now. 
All right, this computer is back together. Everything is working really well. You have to be careful on the plus four. The keyboard connection is a very flimsy ribbon cable. It's not uh, wires like it is on the bread bin C64s and other machines. So you plug it in and out too many times and it will go bad. I've already had to fix it once on this machine by trimming the end off and sort of peeling back the, the layer so it makes good contact again. There's my plus four finished for now. I'm going to talk about one thing which I can predict I am going to hear about in the comments section right now. Essentially, last time I changed the power connector on my C128 to the C64 power connector, people complained that the machine was no longer original anymore. Well, I got to tell you one thing. My Plus 4, 128, and C64s, I use these computers. And since all three of these computers have the same video and power connector, it's very convenient for me just to be able to plop this down on the table where I currently have a monitor set up with disk drives and just connect a couple of cables to be able to use it versus having to dig out the actual matching power supply and plug it into the computer and the power strip with the risk that the one for the plus four might damage the computer one day. So forget that. In this C128 brick, I have a nice, robust, and reliable power supply that will work perfectly for all of my computers. So that's why I changed the connector on this machine. So if you found this video interesting, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Uh, you can definitely put a thumbs down if you totally disagree with me on changing the power connector. Put your comments in the comment section below. And don't worry about the pet. Part 2, where I clean up and try to get that machine working further, will be coming soon. Right now the pet is sitting on my washing machine preventing me from doing laundry. So I do need to get back to that machine and you'll be seeing part two to that series very soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.